The Council of Ephesus in the year of our Lord 431 declared, Since the Holy Virgin brought forth corporally, God made one with flesh according to nature. For this reason, we also call her Mother of God. Most of my material today will come from one of the greatest Thomistic theologians of the last few centuries, the Reverend and esteemed Father Reginald Marie Garrigou Lagrange. The Father states that Mary's divine maternity is the greatest of her gifts. Why would he bother to make that point? Well, because some have argued that, say, her Immaculate Conception was the greatest gift that God gave her, or perhaps her Assumption. But the only real challenge to the claim of Mary's greatest gift comes from her being full of grace. Is it a greater thing that she is full of grace, or is it a greater thing that she is the mother of God? Well, the reason Father gives for saying that it is her divine maternity is that Mary's express consent was required before she would become the mother of God. So while our Lord became present in her womb the moment she said yes to the angel, the Holy Trinity was already present in her soul, and her cooperation with the will of Almighty God was perfect. She conceived in her womb he who was already present in her soul. He whom the world could not contain was contained in a mother's womb, says St. Augustine. Again, from the Council of Ephesus, If anyone will not confess that the Emmanuel is very God and therefore the Holy Virgin is the Mother of God, inasmuch as in the flesh she bore the Word of God made flesh, as it is written, the Word was made flesh, let him be anathema. Pope Pius IX affirmed that Mary's election as the Mother of God comes before her being chosen to be full of grace because the second gift is there to prepare for the first. In other words, included in God's plan for his son to become man was the fact that Mary was to be the mother of that man. Her divine maternity was ordained by God in the very same act whereby he elected to become man. And it was because she was to be the mother of God that she was granted the fullness of grace. For would it not be absurd and unfitting for the Son of God to reside in and take life from anything but the most perfect of creatures. But since the perfection of our Lord is first in the fact that He is God, and God is a spirit, it was not enough that Mary was physically perfect. She had also to be the most spiritually perfect of God's work. And so it was, on account of her divine maternity, that she was also full of grace. Mary was more a cooperator in the divine maternity than any other mother is a cooperator in the conception of her child. For not only did she give to her child all and more that any mother gives physically to a child, but her cooperation in God's plan for her motherhood did not involve the instrumental cause of a man, nor was she moved by passion. It was pure union with God's will. St. Athanasius tells us that, As the flesh was born of Mary, the mother of God, so we say that he, the Word, was himself born of Mary. All that every child derives from its mother, that God the Son derived from Mary. And this, without the cooperation of any man, but by the direct operation of the Holy Ghost, so that in a fuller, truer, and more perfect sense, Mary is the mother of God, the Son, in his incarnation, than any other earthly mother is of her Son. Father Gary Goulagrange also tells us that the beatific vision is something that, by the grace of God, we can merit. We can, by cooperation with God's grace, we have no right to it ourselves, but by cooperating with His grace, we can earn heaven. But the Incarnation is not something that could be earned. It is a gift given truly and freely by God. No one can have a right to it. And so also on this account is Mary's divine motherhood a greater gift than her fullness of grace. Why go into all of that? Why bother discussing which of Mary's gifts from God is the greatest? 
Well, for one thing, as Father points out, we can see then why each of her gifts were appropriate. Her immaculate conception was because of her election as the mother of God. Her sinlessness, the grace of the Annunciation, her mystical union with Christ, her assumption, all of her gifts are because of the fact that she was to be or is the mother of God. So rightly then, does Mary herself say that he who is mighty has done great things to her. He made her the mother of God, and so he also made her fit for that role. It was nothing that she did or could have done. And the church then rightly teaches that the divine maternity, Mary's place as the mother of God, is the source and the summit of all her other gifts and graces. But now let's turn to a more practical conclusion that flows from all of this. I mean, those are truly lofty and edifying thoughts and teachings, wonderful material for meditation, high and deserved praise for Mary, the daughter of Joachim and Anne, and a worthy trumpeting of the wonders God has done for man. But it doesn't end there. These teachings have practical ramifications. In particular, Mary is not only the mother of the Redeemer, but also of all men. We know that it was by her own free consent that Mary became the mother of the Savior. Keep in mind that Mary has and always did have an intellect undimmed by sin of any kind. And so when the angel announced that she was to be the mother of this divine child, she knew full well what that meant. It meant to be also the mother of the Redeemer of all mankind. For that is what the prophecies promised. If we consider the bond not only physically, flesh of my flesh, but also spiritually between a mother and a child, and further, that Mary's union with her child, in fact the very conception of her child, was the result not of her biological but of her spiritual union with God, who was to be her child. How could we not be absolutely positive then about her union with her son in all things, in everything that he was, in everything that he did? He is the Savior, and she is the mother of the Savior. He is God, and she is the mother of God. She wills what he wills. Her union with him is principally spiritual, moral. It is by him and through him that she is all that she is, and it is also by him and through him that she participates in our salvation. She is one with him in all that he does and all that he wills. There is no part of her that does not belong to him and cooperate with him. And so as a sharer in the work of our salvation, she prays and suffered to win for us the grace to cooperate with Christ in our salvation, just as she was disposed to, though she could not earn, the grace of the Incarnation. So she disposes us to receive the grace of our redemption, just as there was no Christ coming into the world to save us without Mary, so there is now no salvation for any individual man without the intercession of Mary. Each and every saint in heaven owes to Mary the honor and respect due not only to the mother of God, but also the same honor and respect that he owes to his own mother. Mary is our mother. Obviously, in the natural sense of the word, we would look to Eve as our mother. But in the life of the soul, Mary is more truly our mother. The life of the soul is grace, and Mary is the mother of the source of all grace. She is not a sister to us in the life of grace, even though she may be called our sister in redemption. Her redemption was worked very differently from ours, but nevertheless, like us, she is redeemed. But in the life of grace, she is our adoptive mother, and God is our adoptive father. But unlike natural adoption, in this spiritual adoption, the life of these parents actually is poured into the adopted children. 
Because we are adopted sons and daughters of God and of Mary, divine life can flow in us. We become, in this sense, divine. Father Gary Goulagrange here quotes St. John's Gospel, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And from all that we've said, we know that Mary would then have been our mother even if she had died before her son, even if she had died when her son was just an infant. Because by her consent to be his mother, she consented to be the spiritual mother of us all. But we know also that Christ left no doubt nor room for question about his mother's maternity of us. For of the seven last things that he said as he hung on the cross, one was reserved to express the, to, for the express purpose of declaring her to be our mother. Woman, behold thy son. And to St. John, behold thy mother. The words of God have power and are not limited by time. They work what they signify. If God says that this woman is our mother, then she is our mother. What tenderness we then receive. Can she care for us any less than she cared for the son of her flesh? It was for us that he gave up his life. What dishonor she would do to him if she loved us any less. But it is not out of compulsion that she loves us. She loves us because of her unity with the Holy Trinity. She wills what God wills, and she loves what God loves. And added to that love is the love of a mother. It's a fine thing to say that she is the mother of God. No greater honor can be paid to her. But it is another thing to reflect on and realize that because she is the mother of God, she is also our mother. And by this motherhood, our salvation is assured, pending, of course, our consent and cooperation. Since the Holy Virgin brought forth corporeally, God made one with flesh, according to nature. For this reason, we also call her Mother of God. And to us, he says... Behold your mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.